Hi, everybody. It's great to see you all. And thank you for being here today. I'm really, really excited to be kicking off our year and fundraiser this, this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, with all of you and with our special guest speaker today, James Stout. And I just thought that before we begin, um, I would uh, give a little bit of a brief just rundown on how the event's going to go. And so first of all, I'm Debbie Bookchin. I'm a steering committee member of the Emergency Committee for Rojava, along with several of the other people who you see here in this room, Arthur and Anya and Oslem. And uh, very happy to, to, to be with you all um, tonight what, and this, or afternoon, if you're on the West Coast, what we're going to be doing is we are going to be hearing from James, James Stout, who's going to be reporting on his recent trip to Rojava and, and, and some other things too, kind of connecting the relevance of the Rojava Democratic Confederalist movement to some of the other work he's been doing in places like Myanmar and uh, also talking a little bit about some of the work that he's been doing with Kurds and other people at the who are stuck right now at the US on the US Mexico border. So that's going to be take up the first part of the the event today, um, about maybe 15 to 20 minutes from James and then some Q and a so we can all join in on the discussion. And then after that, we also have a very exciting presentation a five minute recorded special greeting from Rojava civil diplomacy. Uh, so those are the folks on the ground who do sort of people to people diplomacy or people to people outreach uh, with groups like ours around the world. Um, and we'll be hearing a, a quick report from them. So that'll be nice for about five minutes. And then we're just gonna talk a little bit, a few updates and a little bit about our fundraiser, which is what we're kicking off today. And I um, especially just wanted to take a moment to say something real briefly about that, which is that, as you guys all know, many of you have, have been with us before. And for those who, who are newer to ECR, um, the work that we do is mostly volunteer but obviously we need some budget each year. And, and it's very important to us to, to meet this end of the season kind of end of the year goal uh, of a, a fundraiser of about $10,000. Um, so um, if you have to cut out early for any reason or anything like that, please, before you do check the chat where we'll have a link to uh, our fundraising site, which is on our website at the moment. And then probably by tomorrow, we'll be launching on GoFundMe. And we would just love it if people would share with friends, colleagues, family members, um, share widely our, our fundraising uh, links because uh, either tonight or if more likely maybe with friends tomorrow when we have the GoFundMe page up, because this is a really important uh time of the year, really basically the only part of the year when we're able to raise funds for the things that we need like postage and, and um, you know, a little bit of video production and, and things like, and, and also the support of one part-time staff member. Um, so anyway, so that's just a little advance about that. So let's go right to James. Um, and I'm so excited to hear from him because I haven't been to Rojava in a while myself. And he's just come back from a couple of weeks there. James is a journalist and historian with an interest in anarchism and anti-fascism. His PhD looks at how physical culture built an international anti-fascist alliance in the months before the Spanish Civil War and the anti-fascist 1936 Popular Olympics, which challenged the narrative of the fascist Berlin games. The Popular Olympics and the people who played them and stayed to fight the war are the subjects of his first book. His recent journalism has looked at the 3D printing of guns by pro-democracy rebels in Myanmar, the violence inflicted by the state at the US border, and how the Republic of the Marshall Islands has organized as a community against the threat of climate change. 
Outside of work, he participates in mutual aid on the southern border and enjoys cycling, climbing, and spending as many nights outside as possible. And James recently spent two weeks traveling around Rojava and other parts of Kurdistan. Um, that was in mid-October. And he was especially engaged with research on the way anarchists, or in this case, democratic confederalists, organized for conflict. And in addition to reporting on this trip, he'll be telling us a bit about the presence of the Kurds stuck on the US border with Mexico in outdoor detention sites along the border in Hakumba, California, which is about an hour east of San Diego. And he'll also share some information about communication between the YPG, the People's Defense Units in Rojava, and the pro-democracy mil militia forces of Myanmar as they express solidarity in their common struggles to build a, mul to build a multi-ethnic federated democracy that ensures dignity and safety for everyone in their respective regions. So James, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much again for being with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. That, uh, it's frustrating to say something that you wrote about yourself, for fact, uh, very awkward, but uh, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I think to start off with, I'd like to speak about the time I spent in Kurdistan, um, which was, I think I arrived on like the, well, the 7th of October is a date that stands out in my mind, for probably pretty obvious reasons. I was in Kamishlo at that time. Uh, but I, I traveled all around um, and was very fortunate to be able to meet as many people as I did, given the situation, which if, if you can cast your mind back then, was like at the, the peak of Turkey's drone war uh, against the autonomous administration. Uh, and while I was there, power infrastructure, water infrastructure, uh, asaish, uh, a gas bottling plant, a, a hospital, numerous other civilian targets were were bombed right and um, obviously that's not an ideal situation to be reporting in but it's it's much more importantly not an ideal situation for those people to be living through uh trying as they are to you know, get on with their lives and, and to build their you know a better future for the part of the world and for the rest of the world too so i thought it was as, as a journalist i think I, I think it's important for us to be in places where times are hard as well as you know, where, where people are, are succeeding. And I think sometimes those narratives are missing when we talk about, specifically when we talk about conflict, we very often forget that there are, you know, little children and, and people who are not directly at the front lines. And in, in this case, that they were people who were being targeted uh, either sort of indirectly or directly by these drone strikes. So um, despite that, I had a wonderful time, right? I, I It's very rare in my line of work to be so warmly received by people um, there's normally a sort of sense of like we know we have to talk to you because you're a journalist and you'll write a story for a british or american publication and, and that ensures that the world doesn't forget about us uh, but it, it's rare to feel kind of in solidarity with someone and that they are happy to have you and that like you're sharing in something in, in creating something as opposed to you know, you sort of hover above them for a few days and then leave and then they can get on with whatever they were doing before. Uh, so I very much enjoyed that. Um, I was able uh, to go to Hasaka, uh, to Derek, to Kamishlo, um, and then across uh, the uh, other parts of Kurdistan, uh, to Slimani, uh, to Hyaula, Haula, uh, and, and to talk to a lot of people there. The main I guess focus of my trip um, was I'm, I'm writing a book on how people organize for war without the state or how kind of, I don't want to force everyone into the anarchism bucket, I suppose, but like broadly speaking, people who are building democracies without states, how they organize in wartime. I think it's something that's like relatively sparsely covered, relatively sparsely theorized. And um, as we'll get on to when we talk about Myanmar, I think actually the most important conflicts in the world right now are the ones being fought by these people who are seeking to build a future without the state and, and where people can be treated with dignity and respect, right? Um, I know David Graeber said Rojava was building democracy without the state, which I think is 
probably about as big of a bucket as you can get for anarchism and that's kind of the definition i'm using and um, so within the scope of that i was very interested in talking of course to yepige yepige people about the, the sort of minutia of organizing right and um, i had some excellent conversations about that had some excellent conversations um, which again was so just like i've spoken to a number of military spokespeople in my life uh and it's not always a particularly fun or enjoyable experience, if I'm honest. Uh, but like, I was able to meet uh, a Yepige spokesperson in somebody's apartment. Uh, we had dinner. We talked for hours. We drank an incredible amount of tea, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, you know, we, we, I really felt welcome. And uh, more importantly, like everybody there made me feel welcome and everybody there was comfortable around each other. There wasn't this kind of standoffish, oh, you can't ask that. You can't ask this, you know, this is this isn't something I want to talk about. I only want to talk about this, which is very common when you're speaking to military spokespeople in, in other areas. So I found that very enjoyable. Um, and also just the the openness to talk about things, which as a journalist, again, you, you go with a story you want to write. And I think if you're a good journalist, a good writer, then maybe you come back with a slightly different one. Uh, and I think that's certainly what happened with me. Um, and one of the reasons that I came back with a slightly different story is that while I was in Rojava, um, there was a video that came out from the Kareni Nationalities Defense Force. And um, so the Kareni Nationalities Defense Force, for those of you who aren't familiar, are one of the dozens of pro-democracy groups fighting in Myanmar uh, against a military coup that happened in July of 2021. So um, this coup happened it's almost exactly the script actually that the United States folks used on January 6th. Like, oh, this wasn't, a, there was an election. The military party lost the election heavily uh, because they had been ruling people with a horrendous degree of violence for decades. Uh, people obviously didn't like that. They voted for the National League for Democracy in large numbers. The NLD are far from perfect. They are the people who presided over the genocide of the Rohingya. Um, that, but they, they still represent to the people of Myanmar a better choice than the um, the, the junta, which what I think now people in Myanmar, as we'll get to, have moved past that, that sort of binary choice. Um, but they were overthrown. The military installed themselves in power. People went into the streets to protest. Their protests were first met with tear gas and then with rubber bullets and then with real bullets. Uh, 153 people were killed in one day at one protest. Many of the young people there took to the mountains um, and joined what are called ethnic revolutionary organizations. Uh, there are 53 ethnic groups in Myanmar. Each of them has several languages within them. Um, if you thought that there were a lot of acronyms to understand when you were talking about Rojava, then this is a whole new world of uh, alphabet soup for you. Uh, because each of those groups generally has several armed organizations as well as civilian governance organizations. Um, nearly all of them have joined together in fighting the military dictatorship, which is, is relatively unprecedented to see this degree of unity. And since they began fighting in 2021, uh, I was very fortunate to go with my colleague, Robert Evans, to cover the conflict, and particularly to cover the way that they armed themselves, which is 3D printing guns in this case. Um, they have been, and they'll tell you this themselves, that they really entered this conflict with very little in the way of politics, right? Um, they will, all of them will say that they entered the streets thinking the UN or the EU would come and save them. And when they didn't, they had something of a crisis of faith in these neoliberal institutions. And they've been searching for, for a politics that reflects their lived experience, right? That, that you know, the, for everything that the, the neoliberal governments of the world say, it doesn't really matter if they're going to let you get killed in the streets. Um, one of the things that many of them have shared with me is that they were extremely entrenched in a very misogynist culture for a very long time and that uh, when they took to the streets they they had a number of experiences to include in, in traditional Burmese culture it's considered taboo for men to walk underneath women's longis which are like the robes that they wear when they're drying on a washing line um, and so uh, they decided to use this to their advantage by hanging them over their barricades when they were first in the streets and the military wouldn't come into their protected areas because they didn't want to pass in the least for long use. And, yeah. One of the people I interviewed said that that's when he realized that like sexism hurts everyone. <laughs> so with these things that they've learned, with the failure of these, 
this is, you know, trusted government institution to protect them. They've been looking for alternatives and what they've come across is democratic confederacy. Um, and I've spoken to them about this. Uh, we talk often on Signal, I've suggested books for them to read, et cetera, but I wasn't really aware that we're gonna produce a video uh, that you, you'll see the video, um, it, it's been going around on social media. Um, and I know lots of the Rojava Solidarity channels have shared it. Um, yeah, I saw it for the first time on a TV in, in a restaurant in Kamishlo, uh, which, which was quite something. And a thing that I was really impressed with was like, very rarely do people ever ask you questions <laughs> as a journalist, or if they do, it, it's like the, the guys at um, uh, Samalka who asked me a lot of questions, um, both on the way in and on the way back, uh, very kind of him, um, and, and opened all of my field dressings, which was uh, nice of them. Um, so the, everyone suddenly wanted to ask me what's happening in Myanmar, what can we read, what are they doing, what's their struggle, uh, how can we learn from their struggle? And um, Later in my trip, uh, I went to Slimani uh, to meet um, Zagros Hiwa, who's a spokesman for the Kesaka, uh, a very eloquent and interesting uh, man, someone I was very lucky to speak to. Uh, and we sat down and talked for a long time. And as much as I had questions for him, he also had questions for me. And one of the things that really struck me as admirable, that you certainly don't hear from men on the left very often, is that like we don't have all the answers. And maybe these people have some answers that we haven't found, so we would like to learn from them. Um, and in the time since then, um, I've really been struck by like the um, the thickness of the solidarity, I suppose. And um, like it's very easy to express solidarity, on, you know, on the internet. Make a video, even it's 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 a big step, especially uh, with the ongoing drone war. The response that the FAG and the YPG made, um, I'm sure many of you would have seen it, but if you haven't. It's quite easy to find. They made a very long video expressing solidarity and showing a fairly deep understanding of the conflict in Myanmar. And they took some time to understand it and then they responded. Um, and both groups have been subject to unrestricted bombing, right? Bombing of civilians, bombing of civilian centers. Uh, but it went beyond like videos. For instance, I know young women who have fought in Myanmar who have, um, and, continue, who have and continue to live with post-traumatic stress from seeing terrible things that young people shouldn't see, right? And I'm sure you can imagine some of those. Um, but the fact that like women who were fighting in Rojava took time to reach out to them and do video calls and to talk through things and to help them process the things that they'd seen, because uh, this is one of the things I'm very interested in, right? How, how do these, uh, like, I'll just say anarchists for, for the brevity. How do these groups manage PTSD, right? It's something that, uh, neoliberal capitalism has done a terrible job with. We, we live in a very atomized and alienated society, and, and that shows itself when we, when we have to deal with these traumatic experiences, right? Um, and so I was very interested in how societies that were more communal were able to, to do better with that. And, and obviously, part of that is with that genuine solidarity and caring for other people that I saw expressed in people talking across 4,000 miles and encrypted messaging apps to to help each other uh, through that. So that was something that really struck me as a very important illustration of how both of these movements don't just have national aspirations. It's very easy, especially in the case of Myanmar, but also in the case of Roger, I think, to see them as ethno, uh, to see them written about in, in the press as ethno-nationalist or like as in the case of uh, the self-administration, it being the Kurdish self-administration or just the Kurds or, you know, the SDF as the, I've even seen the SDF referred to as like the Kurdish military forces, which isn't quite correct, um, but it doesn't stop people writing it. And uh, certainly in Myanmar, like I, uh, Debbie and I, sh uh, Debbie shared with me a Washington Post story, which said that like, it basically expressed that the recent gains that the people in Myanmar had made would be for ethno-nationalist groups. and. Actually, the, the ethnic revolutionary organizations have explicitly said that that is not the case and that their goal is for a federal democracy in which all the ethnicities are represented. But in coming to that, in coming to that goal, right, and the Kareni are one of these ethnic groups, they have been become very interested in, in what's happening at Rojava, not just in terms of how to integrate ethnicities or how to organize the military, but also in terms of... Um, how to integrate people who have left the 
military. The, the military force, forcibly conscripts people in a, in a variety of ways. Many of the soldiers who are fighting for the junta want nothing to do with it. I spoke to one last week who said we would all leave if we didn't think that they'd kill our families. Um, so when these, which uh, you will, which will seem very reminiscent to people who are familiar with some of the armed factions in Syria. Um, so they wanted to talk about rehabilitative justice, right? Which I think is admirable for people who are in the midst of a, a war in, in which their cities are being bombed, their people are being killed, uh, to, to think about how we can rehabilitate afterwards. I think it's extremely admirable that, that they're reaching out to ask about those things. And, and that when I spoke to people in the self-administration about their desire to learn about rehabilitative justice, they said, well, we don't have all the answers, but it's something that we want to, so maybe together we can find the answers. And I think that willingness to be humble again really struck me uh, you, again you don't really hear spokespeople for governments or uh, administrations saying we don't have all the answers very often normally they want to tell you they do have all the answers so um i was extremely impressed with that um, and the ongoing solidarity has been i was when i first heard about it i knew that the kareni were interested because uh, a good friend of mine has spent a lot of time with them and uh, in the time we've spent together I've, I've watched him discover anarchism, democratic confederalism, I've watched him read books, you know, go on, on YouTube. But, but I wasn't aware of was that other groups, like the, um, there are various women's, so they, they began with integrated units. They've now moved to separated units, right, along the, the same lines as the, the Yepige Yepige. And this, that's because they found them on YouTube in, to some degree, and that they'd watched documentaries. And the other ethnic groups who, who I've never heard, or I've heard of them, but I've had no contact with, and my friend hasn't either, had also been trying for months to find out how to contact uh, people in, in Rojava and to, to share with them what they've learned and to, and to learn from them in return. So the whole process has really kind of given me hope. And as I said at the start, the, the fact that uh, with no support from anyone rebels in Myanmar are now poised to topple their government, uh, that they didn't even receive a go. Uh, the United States loves to give people guns, right? Uh, they often will not give them very much else, uh, but they didn't even receive guns from the US. They printed their own on their 3D printers. And um, the fact that they've done that without the support of any states, uh, to me illustrates that like, perhaps the era of the state's dominance in these things is, is coming to a close, or at least it questions the state's monopoly on uh, being able to do this kind of violence. And I think that that's something very interesting and, and perhaps it, it points towards a future in which the internet can give us some of what it promised instead of just like, you know, Elon Musk saying horrifically bigoted things uh, that like these people found themselves on the internet. I know that they found out how to manufacture weapons on Reddit uh, because that's where I found them and that, that's how we got in touch for the first time they found the Yepige on, on YouTube and, and watched every documentary that was available with subtitles in Burmese. And, and that has informed what they're fighting for, which I think is really incredible. Um, so on the subject of the state monopoly on violence, the last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, I guess state violence against Kurdish people in Turkey, uh, because once I got back uh, and uh, before I left, actually, I spent a decent amount of every week volunteering with mutual aid work at the southern border of the United States. That's very near where I live. Um, and what Border Patrol has begun to do there is to detain people in what are called open air detention sites. Uh, uh, an open air detention site is, it's just what it sounds like. It, it's a piece of the desert that Border Patrol, they don't, it's not fenced off, uh, but because Border Patrol claims that people aren't detained, but if they leave, they're caught and told to go back. So I think you can probably join the dots there. Um, they, are not given food. Very rarely are they given water by Border Patrol. They're not given shelter, they're not given blankets. Uh, it, it's below freezing at night and it can get up to, some days it was getting up to plus 100 degrees. Um, not in the same day, but uh, over, a, over the period of a month, that's what, it's, it's a desert, right? It, it likes to try and kill people. And so people there are in extreme danger and, and what myself and other mutual aid people have been doing is trying to provide them with food, provide them with water, provide them with shelter. Um, and on my return, I think I was probably wearing something that I'd picked up in Rojava or uh, 
maybe I got a scarf for a friend who's very interested in uh, Rojiva. Uh, and generally you don't get much time to interact with people because there's hundreds of them, right? As many as 800 and there's five of us and we're trying to feed everyone. Uh, but it, it sort of started to be aware that more and more Kurdish people were coming through the border and um, sort of, so once we became aware that they were there, um, we started talking to them and it's been a tremendous illustration. First of all, in like, so some of these people have been former Yepage people. Many of them, like they will sort of, at first they, uh, you can tell that they, that they, they're, you know, concerned with state repression because they won't talk about uh, like political things. And then when they sort of come to realize that that's not such a big concern to them, they'll, uh, they'll talk about their politics. And I think many of them are, I guess what you call democratic federalists. They'll say BG said Capo when you were, uh, you know, when they, when, when we're sitting around the campfire, which is sweet. Uh, and, but they've also been incredible again, like when I talk about solidarity, right? Like, um, as a, maybe it's because we, like we were able to communicate with them a little bit more, but they've been so helpful to us in our work that like every day I'll find myself spooning beans and there are three Kurdish guys next to me giving out rice and water and blankets. And like the first group of Kurdish people I met actually was because uh, I'd gone into a camp, my friends were giving out food and I had gone around to check if there were any very unwell people who were sheltering and like hadn't been able to come out for food. And some people came up to me and they were like, hey, can we have bin bags? And um, you, we've seen you've got those little things for picking up rubbish because it's dirty out here and we want to clean up and it's terrible the damage this is doing to this desert place. And uh, so that for hours, we went around cleaning stuff up and talking and, and just spending time together and learning about each other's lives, which was very valuable. Uh, and I think hopefully gave them a little break from the monotony and uh, sort of cold that, that they have out there. But since then, almost every night, I've been able to sit around campfires and, and share tea and uh, talk to people and be in a little bit in solidarity with them, explain. I think Kurdish people are very, very well placed to understand the difference between a community and the state. So like while our state is doing this to them, our community is doing our best to ease the burden that the state has placed upon them. Um, and so it's been really, again, like another illustration of solidarity. Like it's it's been really humbling to see like, like grown men who are freezing cold. Uh, it's mostly young men who are coming. And that, that's very typical in migration patterns because young men will have the highest earning potential. So they can often send money back and bring the rest of their family back with them. Um, like get out of their tents at, at 10 at night when it's, hovering around freezing because a little child has just walked in across the border and needs somewhere to sleep and it's very touching to see that and uh, it's just been I, I i do a lot of making shelters and it's been fun to work with these kurdish guys from turkey and you know like to get a team of uh, kurdish guys and uh russian i had, had a russian guy a kurdish guy and me and we were building shelters for hours the other day and it, it's a really good illustration of sort of how uh, the things that are supposed to divide us don't have to, I suppose. Um, or these, these barriers kind of melt away when we need each other's help. Um, and it's been really uh, illustrative again to send a picture back to someone from the Yepage and they uh, instantly, they were like, what on earth is this? This is terrible. So they've been helping us with translation. We've been, obviously, uh, my Comanche is, is not very good at all. Uh, uh, I just sort of say words, uh, like nouns, but... Um, uh, they've been helping us translate, which is very kind. Uh, they've, they've helped us sort of uh, help with messaging just to explain to people what the situation is, right? Because for them, they, they're completely unaware. A guy, if you don't speak English, a guy in green with a gun shouts at you and then you're stuck in the desert for several days. And occasionally some people in the U-Haul turn up and, and bring you rice and beans. Uh, so just to be able to communicate with them. Uh, also, our friends at Signals Rising have helped us uh, with radio so we can communicate between the camps. So thank you very much for that. Um, but yeah, we uh, we have all like gained a great fondness for these people because of how they continue to be upbeat because of how they're always helping other people. Uh, and, and it's again, showed me a lot of the, like the thickness of that solidarity that even in a really terrible situation, uh, these people are really committed to to helping other people, to building community, to, to showing solidarity. Uh, I'm going down tomorrow, so I'm sure uh, I will be able to build more shelters with them tomorrow. Uh, 
I think I've taken more selfies with like I think maybe in in Bakur I'm like the most famous uh, guy now because because I've taken thousands of selfies with people. Uh, but they've given us gifts, you know, when people could only bring one backpack across the world to take something out of it and give it to someone. I think it's very touching. Um, so we've really enjoyed that time we got to spend with them and like to see that solidarity in action both here and in Myanmar has really given me a great fondness for the movement in Rojava. And I hope to go back. I hope to go back at a time when I can meet people in, in places that are not sort of semi-clandestine because, because of the continuing drone war and where, you know, we don't have to always be looking at this guy and wondering if he's going to kill us. Um, so, uh, yeah, I feel a great deal of solidarity with them. Um, and I think that's important as a journalist to to be in solidarity with the people you're reporting with. I, I think this idea of neutrality is is nonsense. Like, we all have biases. We'd be much better off just declaring them. Uh, so obviously, I have a great deal of sympathy for their project. Um, and I think that being in solidarity, being there at a difficult time, being able to see how that society even under stress has so many successes and things that we can learn from and also so many challenges and things that we can hopefully help with so yeah that that's very important to me sadly i cannot sell news articles for love nor money about what's happening there especially with the situation in, in israel and palestine which has been very upsetting but uh, that, that's the nature of the news media in the u.s i think they strongly believe that people aren't intelligent enough to care about two places in the world at once which i don't think is true or you wouldn't all be here uh but yes i it it's been at once a really reinforcing and, and uh i guess uh I've sort of confirmed a lot of things that i hoped were true and, and then also it's confirmed a lot of things that i am sad are true about the press yeah but those have been my experiences i hope some of that has helped you guys with what you what you came for uh I'm really happy to answer any questions that people have about any of those things. I, I can't speak on behalf of the people of Myanmar or, or Rojava, but uh, I'm happy to try and tell you what I know. James, thank you. Oops, thank you so much for that. That was really a, a wonderful overview of of the situation and also what you've been doing. And for those people who are just, uh, who have entered some time uh, since we first began, I just wanna remind everybody that um, you can feel free to ask any questions in the chat uh, that you might have for James. And that we're now gonna enter a period of some questions, discussion, and that after that, we'll be hearing from directly from Rojava in, in terms of a recorded announcement from the Civil Diplomacy Center there. So that'll be coming up in another, whatever, 15 or 20 minutes. And, uh, and what I'm going to do now is maybe just uh, present a couple of questions to James. I guess, uh, Anya, if there's anybody who really wants to ask their person in their question in person, they could put their hand up. Is that possible too? Yeah, you could put your hand up and then, uh, okay, Afia, we see yours. <laughs> and that's great, thanks. I'm gonna start with the, one of the first ones that came in uh, and then we'll go right to you, okay, Afia? Uh, so James, one of the questions that came in while you were speaking um, has to do with kind of how you um, experienced sort of this state of affairs with state being a pun intended in the history of the conflict, specifically kind of, I think um, what he wants to know is sort of what's the precedent for this kind of decentralized and non-state forces being so active right now and sort of going so far right at this particular moment in history. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm a historian. I'm, I'm a historian of the Spanish Civil War, so it's like a different time. And I think that like, that is when we sort of see the peak, right? When we think about anarchists at war and that those people who would call themselves anarchists or anarcho-syndicalists, that's what we think about, right? Maybe we think about Nestor Machno, but mostly we think about Buenaventura de Buti as, as a sort of uh, high point. There are probably more people subscribing to the idea of democracy without a state who are fighting against a state right now than there were at that time, which is quite remarkable. Um, and it really wasn't 
until the, the arrival of internationals in Rojava that we saw a similar thing, right? There were internationals in the Daruti column. Um, the flag behind me is international brigades, which was the, uh, of course, like a statist example of international solidarity that unfortunately came to be dominated by the Soviet Union and lost much of its reason for existence in the process. Um, but I think we are at a relatively unprecedented time because the access to information is somewhere that it's never been before, right? Um, so like, actually on my wall, but I'm not gonna get it. Um, I have a, I have a gun that was sent from, Mex from Russia to Mexico to Spain in order to arm the people of Spain to fight against fascism, right? Um, it's not a very good gun. And by the time it had been three times around the world, it was a worse gun. But the Republic essentially died as much as we can blame any one cause. It was, um, it was the absence of solidarity in the form of weapons, right? Solidarity is all good when you can, you know, the like postcards, pictures, uh, posters, you know, statements of deep concern from international bodies aren't going to help you when someone's trying to kill you and, and, and weapons are. And obviously they're also going to help kill people. They can do terrible things. Um, but um, they allow people to defend themselves against the state and they question the state's monopoly on violence. And access to those is incredibly democratized now, I suppose. And, and the reason this whole project started was that um, I'm the person who's interested in that stuff as a conflict reporter. And uh, I spent some time on a, a 3D printed gun Reddit and saw young people in Myanmar asking questions. And, and I knew I could tell from the background of the photos they were not in the United States. And I very quickly worked out it was Myanmar because I've spoken to people in Myanmar before this who were fighting with air rifles, slingshots, muzzle loading muskets. And with those things, they weren't able to carve out spaces where they could experiment with self administration, spaces where they could experiment with gender equality, uh, and, and spaces where they could begin to think about what a future without the state looked like, right? So I think. As as scary as this, this proliferation of, of weapons might be for people in the United States, uh, I'd probably counsel you that it's so easy to get a gun here in America anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, but um, it it represents a change in conflict that we are just seeing in Myanmar. The world had written them off and left them to die. Uh, and it, uh, there was a, a shocking lack of concern for the incredibly brutal things that the hunter was doing to people. Uh, and it really illustrated the hypocrisy of this kind of rights-based world order or rules-based world order, right? Like, like rules don't apply if you don't have any resources for us to extract afterwards. So um, I think with that, I think I think maybe we will see a change in conflict. And I think that is relatively unprecedented. Like anarchists in Spain made a total of 12,000 pistols. It took them two years to do them. Uh, they have Francesca Castle's name on them. They're very cool in a collectible sense, but they, they weren't able to arm themselves, right? They had to engage in illicit arm deals with the Czechs to arm themselves. The idea of arming oneself now is, is possible, and I think that's relatively unprecedented. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna um, next call on Afia to ask her own question. Can you, are you unmuted? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Thank you, Debbie. And, and thank you, James, so much. It's such a pleasure to hear you speak and the, for the work that you do. Um, so uh, my question, I kind of have two questions, but I have really an important question. And maybe if I, there's time, I'll ask a small yeah. question. But um, it's it's mostly about the Rohingya. I'm really curious um, how the the process of, you know, the sort of uh, the anarchist movement in Myanmar, mm -hmm. the influence of the um, of democratic confederalism, you know how that's you know impacted people's view of the Rohingya and society and thinking about a multi ethnic society. You mentioned that a few times, like where people considered um, the space for Rohingya were in that society, and then my my smaller question is just. Um, just thinking about, you know, you mentioned that there were a lot of soldiers who don't actually want to be soldiers for the junta. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how that, if anyone from the, um, the you know, the democratic forces side, how that impacted them in their fighting. Because I imagine there's something quite 
um, psychologically traumatic about attacking people and knowing that they might not even want to be there. Um, or sort of like they're attacking you, you're defending yourself, but you're sort of in a fight that someone else is being forced to fight against you. So anyways, that complication. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will very briefly say that the Burmese military distributes something called Yabo, which is a methamphetamine derivative, which which makes consent a very complicated thing and, and sort of really messes with that dynamic. Uh, but to answer your first question about the Rohingya, I think it's a very good one. The anarchists have always been with the Rohingya, and we can see this from the Burmese punk scene. Uh, we can see people in the Burmese punk scene being persecuted uh, to a very great degree because of their solidarity with the Rohingya people from the beginning of the genocide. And I think they're incredibly brave people, and I admire them very greatly. Um, I talk to them a lot, and I have a lot of respect for them. In terms of the rest of society, people who uh, weren't really concerned with politics before the coup, they have moved a very great deal on their position on this. Um, and they will tell you this themselves. Another thing I admire about them is they're, they're absolutely forthright in admitting their faults. Uh, they will tell you that they had been persuaded that the Rohingya were subhuman, were terrible, were, were, were entirely deserving of the persecution or somewhat deserving of the persecution. Uh, and this is because the, the junta, to an unprecedented degree, and the, the sort of the, the the military within the NLD, right? The military was kind of a, a not really governed by the NLD even when the NLD was in power. Used bots on Facebook to demonize the Rohingya. And many people will be aware of this. We've been not. Facebook is synonymous with the internet in Myanmar. If you have a data plan on your phone, Facebook data is free. Other data is very expensive. So Facebook is everything. Their botnet was incredibly effective. At, at, spreading terrible Islamophobia. Now, if you talk to young rebels now, uh, many of them have been incarcerated with Rohingya people for a brief period of time, and they feel a sense of solidarity and also a great deal of shame about what happened, I think, to the Rohingya people. I have friends who have been incarcerated with the Rohingya who you know, have said, I can't believe we let this happen to them as people. Uh, but I think it's also given them a skepticism about the state that, that they will carry with them past the issue of solidarity with the Rohingya. Um, I'm hoping, by the way, we'll be able to hear more from the Rohingya more. I recently sent them a bunch of uh, audio equipment so they can do some uh, podcasting and radio stuff. Uh, but um, to answer your second question, I'm sure it is very troubling. Uh, and I think to a degree when anyone who we are fighting, we find ourselves in, in when someone is shooting at us, we have to do our best to to not think about the person on the other end of that bullet because war is inherently dehumanizing and traumatic. Uh, as I said, the the Burmese military distributes something called Yaba, which probably makes those people less uh, like conflicted, right? Those, even those soldiers who don't want to be fighting, I think when you've had a healthy dose of that, and when someone else is shooting at you, you're going to shoot back at them. Uh, and when your family are held hostage, you're going to shoot back at them. So um, I, I don't think like, while prisoners of war have not always been treated well by the rebels, the majority of times they have. Uh, they pay a bounty for defectors. Uh, they pay a bigger bounty for the defectors come with their weapon, but so people can leave and they can get a bounty. There is an underground movement that smuggles their families out to facilitate people deserting. Uh, and that is a high risk endeavor, right? The, the people who are smuggling those families out are risking their lives uh, and that they will they would be treated about as badly as you can treat a person if they were caught um, in, in any way you can imagine. So the way they've dealt with that is by trying to open ways out. Um, and they are continuing to do that. And that is becoming more and more common. It's been the, since the 27th of uh, October, there was an operation called Operation 1027, which happened all across the country, it began in the north with several ethnic groups and while the top door was distracted in the north, other ethnic groups around the country joined, so they've made massive gains. And we've seen massive defections as well. Um, so I think they deal with that by trying to provide every avenue possible for those people to leave. But most of them will have family in the military, and, and they, they will know how little consent there is on those for those people to be there. So yeah, Thank very... Thanks, James. I'm going to, Spike, if you'll just give me a minute, I'm going to go to love together a couple of questions in the comments and then come to you, Spike. Um, one of our members was interested, James, in just knowing 
a little bit more about the Kurdish community in the border camps. A specific question was how large is that community in the border camps? I think it's something that um, a lot of people have been unaware of until, until you're reporting on this. And then the other question is um, a request for your experience in Rojava um, as to sort of gender relations in terms of daily life. And I'm not sure if you had time to spend time with families and, and or were more engaged with the military, but if you had any observations or insights on that, people would like to hear. Yeah, definitely. So in terms of Gender relations, first of all, um, I spent a decent amount of time in, in Middle East and North Africa, but not, not a lot. Uh, I, I was very, obviously, you, um, I was very struck by not just like the relations between men and women, but the way women carry themselves with confidence, are able to be who they want to be and sort of realize their goals and dreams, just the same as men, right? And obviously, for anybody living there, there are difficulties in realizing their goals and, and dreams in life because... Turkey keeps bombing all the things that they use to organize our society. But um, within those constraints, I was very, my fixer was a woman. I've been doing this for 10 years. I've never had a woman who was a fixer. Uh, so that was great. And we could, uh, you know, I, I, I would hope that I treated her with absolutely as much respect as I, I, I would a man if we were working together. And, uh, you know, lots of our interviews were, I was interviewing a woman and it wasn't a problem that we were on our own talking you know but and they i think just walking around the market and such um you you get a sense for a society where gender equality has been entrenched i'm sure that not a hundred percent of people living within the self-administration are a hundred percent on board with that right like I'm, I'm sure that there are people who uh i'm guessing chiefly men who, who, who would prefer it to go back to the way it used to be but uh i've spent some time with congress star as well uh good deal of time with them and uh, I, I really admire what they've done I think it, it is a meaningful uh, change in gender relations and one that is admirable um for the second question the size of these communities right it's a bit complicated um let's say that our, there are three camps in Hakumba each of those camps can have between zero and 300 people uh we had 500 one day uh, right after Thanksgiving, because they weren't taking people over the holidays, so that was a hell of a mess. But um, people can stay there from between a few hours to six days. Uh, so, so it's a constantly shifting community. I've never been there and not had Kurdish people. And I've never been there and not had a couple of dozen Kurdish people when there's more than like 100 people in the camp. So they represent a significant, uh, significant number in the camps. So they're probably... The largest group will probably be currently Chinese people. Um, and each of these camps is centered around a gap in the border wall. Um, many of you will be familiar with the border wall. Uh, probably few of you will be many familiar with the fact that it just stops for mountains and valleys and large piles of rocks uh, because they were trying to build as much as possible before the election. Uh, and so it just has yawning gaps. People literally just walk around the end of it. Um, and so that, that's where they come and they surrender themselves to Border Patrol to claim asylum. So each of these different gaps, news is spread via social media. So you get different language groups, right? And one thing that, that's quite interesting about the Kurdish people is often, like, if they don't understand that you understand Kurdish people exist, they'll say they're Turkish. And you'll be like, oh, you're Kurdish. And most of the time they'll be like, oh, yeah. And then, you know, they'll, you know, we'll, we'll do a little bit of back and forth and then they'll realize that we're kind of aligned and, and then, then we can talk more freely, I suppose. Um, but there are also Turkish people among them and, and they're not persona non grata, right? They're sharing tents. They're, they're not, uh, you know, in sort of distinct or sort of separated. Uh, so you'll find both both Turkish and, and Bakuri people together and without animosity. But they are a significant proportion of the camps like and they're a significant proportion of our efforts to do mutual aid in the camps i think it's not just them but there was i was a couple of colombian guys helping me hand out food the other day i know my friend built some shelters with a kyrgyz gentleman today yesterday um but without the support of people in the camps we wouldn't be able to help the people in the camps and the kurdish people have definitely been front and center of like uh uh, helping us distribute food helping us make sure that everybody even those most in need who are the last ones to run to join the line right uh, make sure that they get fed so uh, yeah there are definitely a significant number of people there 
Thank you, James. This, some of what you're describing is so fascinating, you know, in, in terms of also just the sort of the different ways that people to people communication is working and solidarity is expressing itself, especially at a time when when people more and more feel that nobody feels like their government speaks for them in any sense of the in any sense of the word at any, any time more now than ever. So I think these are really all important and interesting interesting things to be following. And uh, next I'll, I'll ask Spike to uh, unmute and, and uh, uh, ask his question. Thanks for waiting patiently, Spike. And actually Spike, just before that, I just wanna mention to people again, some of the people who have joined us a little later, this is a kind of a fundraising kickoff for ECR. And we are gonna be posting in the chat a link to our um, fundraising page on our website for this evening. But also tomorrow we'll be on up on uh, GoFundMe. And we're really asking and urging people to share that link with their friends, family, and comrades so that we can get our, meet our, two our 2023 $10,000 end of the year fundraising goal. It would be super appreciated. We'll have a little more on that later, but go ahead, Spike. Thanks so much for waiting. Oh, thank you, Debbie, Anya, Arthur, and James for putting this together. It's been a really enlightening discussion. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, also about the, the Kurdish uh, migrants that are coming right now. Um, I know they're only staying a short while in the camps, and I was wondering if you're aware of where they're going in the United States in particular, um, and if perhaps ECR can follow up and do outreach directly to them to try to support them as they uh, find their their space here in the United States. Yeah. Um, they, and, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Are you sure, is there anything more I'm happy to? No, no. Uh, yeah. Just a side comment. I'll follow up after. Cool. Yeah, please do. Um, you know, Spike has been helping us a great deal with uh, communication between these camps, by the way. We we have been using radios because there's no cell phone signal there, which is a whole other problem because like I, said, I was speaking to a young woman yesterday who hadn't been able to talk to her mom for four days, right? And this is not a, a journey without risk. So being held in a place where you can't communicate for four days, I, one can imagine that, that this, this young woman's parents probably assumed something terrible had happened. So uh, being able to communicate has been a great boon, not just to us, but but to them. Uh, so um, in terms of where they are going, uh, it's a good question. I do stay in touch with them, right? We, we just give them our WhatsApp numbers normally. Um, Many of them have gone to San Francisco. Uh, they're trying to find work. They're trying to find places to stay. Uh, some of them will have friends or family that they're going to stay with in other places, but, um, or, you know, diaspora. More Generally, I'll see groups, like I've met people from, uh, for instance, Kalmyks, right, which is a small ethnic group in Russia who are Buddhist. They've just literally found a diaspora community and, and been like, we'll go there and someone will help us. Uh, with Kurdish people, they, they, they spread out more, but the a number of the ones I've spoken to have uh, have gone to San Francisco. They may or may not have work permits, uh, and they will often have notices to appear, which is to say a court date for their asylum hearing in 2027. Uh, 2027 was one I heard in May, so we may be pushing out to 28 plus now, right? Uh, so hopefully they have work permits, because obviously it's, it's next to impossible to support yourself without working. Um, and uh, they've also spent a great deal of money to cross the border as much as ten, fifteen thousand uh, dollars to just to just to to be allowed to cross the border. Um, and so I think that the support would be really appreciated. Uh, some of these guys are they've been to Rojava, they fought in the Yepage, right? They, they've shown me lots of photos. Many of their families, they've shown me pictures of their families who have been martyred, right? Um, even the folks who don't take much interest in in, in Rojava, right? not not because they're not interested, just because they're busy giving out food. But everyone knows the little yellow and green pictures and what they mean now. I think, uh, or at least a lot of us do. Um, and so, they would really appreciate the support and just the solidarity. I think a, a thing with arriving in like I, I'm obviously not born in the United States, but arriving in a strange country is, is feeling welcome. And I think people reaching out and expressing solidarity and welcome would be a service in and of itself. Um, 
and I can work out how to do that. Uh, maybe we can talk off the call, but uh, yeah, I have lots of their contact information. And for the most part, they're going to San Francisco. And if they don't have a home uh, work permit, they're probably sending outside a DIY shop with lots of other people trying to find cash work, I would suppose. Uh, thanks. I uh, hope we can follow up with that. And uh, just uh, one other question. Did you mention that the Pesh uh, searched your field dressings when you were crossing and you were in? Yeah, that, that was a really interesting that story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I like to um, vacuum seal like sea locks, you know, the, um, the wound packing gauze that is, um, it makes blood clot, what's it called? Uh, hemostatic. Uh, is that right? I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, he must have a buzz. Yeah, mm -hmm. the fucking doors. Um, I like to vacuum seal that because when you get it in the GI packs, it's big and crinkly and annoying. And then if you vacuum seal it, it's much smaller and you can put it in the back pocket of your jeans and carry it around. And should you need it, it's there. If you don't need it, you don't let the guy carrying around a first aid kit, um, which I found has generally been beneficial. Uh, they found these kits and opened them. And I guess, like, partially the fault was mine for saying, like, yeah, that's my drug gauze. Um, and, and so then they opened all my gauze. Uh, but there, there was no, uh, <laughs> there, there were no no illicit substances in the gauze. But uh, I just had to then, it, like, it's not supposed to be sterile, so it's fine. I just had to kind of wrap it in saran wrap when I got to my next destination and carry it around like that. Thank you, James. That's great. Um, I, I wanted to also pose another question that I think we have here on our uh, in our chats. Um, but while I am looking for it, um, well, why don't we? While I'm looking for that, why don't we go to Paul? I believe that's Paul who has his hand raised. Paul, can you? Thank you so much, Debbie. And uh, really, thank you so much to all the organizers for this uh, lovely talk. Question is for, for Mr. Stout. It's about the um, comment you mentioned about the uh, basically in the liberated spaces, how, how they're kind of forging um, uh, th that space in terms of carving out uh, different governance. Uh, particularly, you, you mentioned the the, the Kareni experience uh, in in Myanmar, and I remember, you know, they had that in in before Manoplar fell, and this is decades ago, of course. And because of the media blackout, we hear so little about about what's what's going on there. And I'm wondering if you could contrast the liberated spaces in AANES Rojava and and how they're run and how they're able to make the best use of of not being under occupation versus how the Kareni have been able to to do that, particularly in the last two years, have, have they been able to to basically self govern in some of these areas? Is have they been able to contest Manoplar and, and eventually uh, attempt to liberate it? If you could give us a, a little bit of a a, a contrast there. Yeah, and um, so as we speak, they're in the process of liberating Lorikor, which is a major city, uh, biggest city I think in their uh, area. Uh, they liberated the university a couple of days ago. Uh, and, and started holding classes again, which I thought was interesting. Like you saw these young people sitting down with their weapons and their combat gear on, sitting in the university. Um, but um, the the way that they govern, I think, is that so there have been liberated spaces in Myanmar since Myanmar has existed outside of British colonialism, as you mentioned. Right, uh, this is one of the longest wars in history. It's, it's 1948. Uh, Essentially, Myanmar was promised when the British left a federal democracy, it never got one. And so these people have been fighting for that. Um, but in terms of how they're governing the liberating spaces now, I think things are changing very rapidly. So in the Kareni case, there's something called the IEC, Interim Executive Council. And I know that uh, they are one of the groups that have expressed interest in these different ideologies. A friend of mine is very interested in, in uh, Kareni friend of mine, uh, is very, very interested in sort of talking more to them about the IEC, about, about democratic federalism. But there have been massive changes in these liberated spaces in the past two years. For instance, I know that uh, marriage equality was something that some of them uh, recently recognized, right? Um, so so same-sex marriages, because there were gay people fighting side by side with uh, with straight folks in the, in the PDF, the People's Defense Forces, and, and 
that help them recognize that those people should have equal rights under the state or under the administration so um, that they have now committed marriage equality so it's a much less developed uh administration in, in many senses than what we see in aes but in another sense it's more developed because it has existed for so long but it's the fact that it's been changing so rapidly is really inspiring to me that it um that like what we saw in liberated uh, cartoule is, is the word for like the Karen areas, right? Um, what we saw there, you know, a few years ago, and things things are different now because of this influx of people who are not ethnically Karen or Kareni. They are ethnically Burma for the most part, um, which is the majority ethnicity of Burma, right? They have joined with these ethnic revolutionary organizations, and, and so in that encounter both of those groups have been changed and changed their politics. Right? So I think sometimes, and for instance, the Washington Post article, Debbie sent, not not to uh, to pick on the Washington Post or Debbie for sending it, but I think they, they draw a distinction between the PDF and the ethnic revolutionary organization, which doesn't exist on the ground. Those guys didn't get training or weapons by clicking their fingers. They got training or weapons by making them themselves and they learned from the gunsmiths and the EROs. And, and they learned to fight from the EROs, right? So they, they are essentially integrated. They fight side by side. Um, and I think it's wrong to see them as distinct. And so in that encounter, governance is being renegotiated as we speak. You know, James, I think that people are actually have a lot more questions also about, especially about Kurds who I think a lot of people are surprised or here and questions about the diaspora. But yeah. I know there I know there are also folks who are very anxious to hear from the Civil Diplomacy Center, which is just, as I said, just a five minute greeting. Would you be able to stick around a little and continue sure. this conversation? Um, as long as you need, uh, that's, I'd love to hear from them as well. So I do. Great. So what we're gonna do folks now is we're gonna take a, a moment and go to that video, um, we're really fortunate to have wonderful people. And, um, and I'd like to think thanks in part even to the work that we've done here at the uh, Emergency Committee for Rojava um, with many of our volunteers who have helped teach English at the University of Rojava. So we've got the, the good fortune of having uh, uh, Nushan Hussein, who does speak English, um, presenting five minutes of greeting and kind of an update that's really quite, quite interesting. So I'm excited to hear, to share that with you. And I think Anya's going to take it over and, and play that video. And then when we come back, we'll talk some more with James. I'll give a little bit of an update on our fundraiser and uh, we'll, we'll be able to chat some more with James. But as I said before, keep an eye on the chat. We've been posting links to our, I'm not sure if right now if it's our GoFundMe page or our homepage, but either way, whether you go to our homepage or, or direct to GoFundMe, you can get there. And like I said, we're really hoping that you'll share it. And if you can, and, I, and we understand that not everybody can right now make even a small donation. Um, when we come back, I'll talk a little bit about some of the prizes or gifts that we have for for a certain donation categories. So thanks, Anya. Uh, let's hear from the Civil Diplomacy Center in Rojava. First of all, I would like to send greeting from Rojava, North and East Syria to all comrades and friends in the emergency committee for, for Rojava. We are located in different parts of the world, but we have common ideas on many issues. If we want to explain the situation on Rojava North and East Syria, we have to analyze the conflict in the Middle East and the world in all its aspects. After the recent attacks launched by the Turkish state on October 4, the situation has become more critical and requires many efforts by the autonomous administration and society as a whole to continue re resistance and resilience. In recent attacks, the Turkish state has targeted infrastructure on a large scale in the autonomous administration area. The Turkish authorities stated clearly before the attacks that they would target all sources of life in northeast Syria. 
According to the Autonomous Administration, the attacks resulted in billions of dollars in losses and the, and the almost complete destruction of many electricity, energy, and water stations, in addition to the destruction of, the, of some hospitals and schools. On the, or, on the other hand, the Turkish occupation forces are still targeting civilian and military le leaders using drones, and these systematic attacks have reached what we call, what we can call slow annihilation. The main goal of the, these attacks is to paralyze the autonomous administration so that it becomes unable to source and sec or secure the life requirements of citizens. Thus, the situation becomes more complicated and conflict and instability continue in the region. The provide, this provides the opportunity for ISIS cells to emerge again. As the Civil Diplomacy Center, as we work with community institutions, unions, and professional syndicates that represent a large segment of people, we see that the aggressive plan has not achieved its goal yet because there is community awareness about these attacks. Despite the difficult condition, condition that people here live in, they are united around autonomous administration and are standing for on, or on their land. We find the violence is increasing everywhere and aggression and occupation plans are increasing by nation states and with the support of hegemonic powers. Israel's conflict conflicts with Hamas is not separate from the Turkish state's plans regarding Rojava. It's the same concept. It, it generally aims for more occupation, displacement, and demographic change. Two days ago, we saw that the Turkish state was opening the way for families from Gaza to enter occupied Afrin. We believe that Turkey planned this from the beginning. People's here in Rojava know the difference between Hamas and the Palestinian people, just as they know the difference between Zionism and the Jewish people. They know that the ongoing wars are not a war, are not war of peoples, but a war of states over power. Therefore, the, this complex situation requires more effort in communication and mutual support and working to provide public opinion with the correct information. Our intensive activities make a difference, but they are not enough to stop dirty plans. Therefore, we must diversify our methods of communication, cooperation, and ma mass mobilization to make the world a better place to live. With much respect and greetings from Rojava and Civil Diplomacy Center, we wish you a Merry Christmas and strong, and strong will to continue together. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anya, for that. And, and thanks, of course, to Nurshan Hussein. Uh, for those powerful and inspiring words. And you know, of course, as she points out, um, Turkey, the, uh, uh, many people here know that ECR originally began, in fact, in 2018, particularly in response to Turkey's occupation of Afrin. And that bombardment essentially of Rojava has continued and continued and continued. And as she, as Nurshan pointed out, has been, um, the source of incredible suffering for people there, not only the hundreds of thousands of people who've been displaced from their homes in Afrin and other parts of the region, but also the innocent civilians who have been 
mutilated, who have been killed, many children included, and, and really makes our internationalist efforts all the more important. Um, and I think the other thing that I, that I just wanted to emphasize is just how much Turkey is really going after women in AANES and the fact that more than anything else, probably it's the women's revolution and the way women have implemented not only the full empowerment of women, but the, the various other aspects of the revolution, the directly democratic governing process that is so threatening to Turkey. So um, as we move into the new year, obviously the, the work of ECR is going to continue to be as important as ever. Um, we are, as you many of you know, because uh, many of you have been involved, we're, we're looking not only for money, but also for your involvement. We really, really do hope next year to um, expand our efforts, you know, to continue not only the kinds of things we have been doing, the articles, the interviews, um, working with unions here in the United States and, and sort of helping connect cooperatives here in the U.S. with cooperatives in Rojava, uh, working on uh, the Freedom for Ajalon campaign, and even some, you know, some fun side things like, for example, our own Uslam Gunnar is working on a, uh, has started a kind of an artist's committee to, to do that work on the Ajalon campaign where people can, um, donate essentially or express their opinion about the, the imprisonment for more than 20 years of Ocalan, um by through their art. And so we have all kinds of initiatives. And so we also just really want to urge people to go to our website to contact us at info at uh, defendrojava.org where we can add you to our mailing list. We don't send out a lot of emails, but we've got a, a mailing list that would keep you apprised. And of course, monthly meetings and, and, and especially also the work that we're doing right now in advocacy, which is so important, which is particularly to continue to keep the pressure on Congress to halt and prevent the sale of F-16 fighter jets to Turkey, which are directly used in the, the, the bombing and the bombardment uh, of Rojava. So um, just to, to sort of put a little conclusion on the fundraising pitch here, I wanted to mention, of course, that among other things that we are a 501c3 organization, so all donations are tax deductible. And you can certainly share that fact with anybody with whom you can share our link, um, which has been posted in the chats. Um, and for those who can afford it, we've got, as we have in past years, we've got Meredith Tax. This is beautifully written and brilliantly incisive book, A Road Unforeseen, for people who can afford to donate $50 or more. And for those who can donate $75 or more this year, we're offering a lovely color eight by 10 print by Mauricio Centurin from Rojava. So it's one of four images, which of course we'll be in touch with people about which one they would like. Um, for those who can donate $100 or up to $150, we've got a beautiful hand printed Jinjian Azadi t-shirt. And again, would be in touch with people about sizes. Um, and all these things, by the way, can be seen on our fundraising page. And for those who are feeling flush enough to give $150 or up to 200, we've got a lovely tote bag, our tote bag, which is also available on the site and which I can actually hold up right here, which is very handy and very pretty as well. And of course, you know, for, for folks who donate $200 or more, there's a combination of all of those things. So um, I wanted to, again, just, you know, urge people to please help us out with this, with this end of the year effort. And um, uh, now I think maybe the fun thing to do would be to go back and share some more, have a little more conversation with James. I think if James, if you can stick around another 15 minutes, I think that would be great. There's definitely people who, who want to engage um, and, and have lots of questions for you. And, and again, thank you so much for, for being here with us. So um, Shireen has had her hand up and um, 
we'll go to Shireen. And then after that, we'll continue with a couple more questions. Are you unmuted? Shireen, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Yes. There you go. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for this incredible uh, information from the gentleman and um, uh, for all those information. And I want to add, uh, add and support your speech, whatever you said, you know, I'm supporting it. I, I will uh, share the links for uh, GoFundMe and all those in our uh, KAG group. And uh, I am uh, suggesting we can do something for delisting PKK as uh, from the terrorist list as they uh, recently Japan take out the PKK from the terrorist list. Can we do something in 2004 for that uh, uh, activity or something? Uh, or not, or what we can do, because, uh, you know, the main problem is because uh, PKK is in, uh, in terrorist list in the U.S., that's the, uh, perhaps, in, like, uh, not letting people to work more in this way. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Shireen, for, for that. And um, I do want to point out that that has, uh, delisting the PKK has been sort of on one of the many demands that we have had over the years um, and the work that we've been doing, uh, along with, for example, political recognition for Rojava. Um, and, you know, at the, at the moment, one of the things that we are also trying to do and that I think is also particularly important given the fact, especially that not everybody can make a, a financial donation is we really wanna grow our organization. And that would help us a lot with a, with a broader effort for, for issues like delisting the PKK. So if folks, again, uh, wanna sign up uh, or tell their friends, come to a monthly meeting, uh, get involved in one of our little committees. Uh, we have an advocacy and a um, outreach committee. And again, we have other, you know, media committee and a, and sort of an artist committee. That would be, that would really be nice. Uh, I think that in a way your question kind of leads directly into one of the other questions that I've seen in the chat, which I wanted to go to, which had to do with the diaspora. And so we were, we, there was a question about sort of how does the diaspora um, both for Myanmar, but also especially the Kurdish diaspora, which is generally, as people know, much larger in Europe. How does that play a role? This was a question for James in, in both of these movements. Yeah, um, the Burmese diaspora, uh, Myanmar is, is another way of saying Burma, right? The, the name was changed by the junta, so they wish to just call it Burma because, you know, they want to do what they want. Um, but uh, the Burmese diaspora has been great. They have, they are a hundred percent behind the rebels. I've not, I've yet to meet a, a pro hunter uh, or even hear of a pro hunter Burmese person in the diaspora. If it wasn't for the diaspora, I don't think I'd be able to do my work. Like in the early days, uh, it it was Burmese people on various Burmese solidarity sites and subreddits that helped us translate, that helped make the connections for us, um, because we would very often see that the first Burmese friend I made with this young man who was fighting in the, in the Kareni uh, Generation Z Army, uh, or Gen Z for American people, uh, uh, who, who would live stream his combat on his phone. Uh, and it was through, through some diaspora people that I was able to translate and talk with him. Uh, sadly, he was killed, um, which is a great shame, but um, they are 100% behind them in terms of impacting Look, I don't know how they get the the conventional weapons they do, but I've seen some with Bass Pro Shop stickers on them. Uh, so one assumes that those are coming from somehow from the United States, but it's quite possible that they they don't. It's quite possible that they come directly from China and they put those stickers on where they're manufactured in China. Um, but but that certainly makes a difference. Uh, 
And of course, with the Kurdish diaspora, I think they have played a very important role in keeping Rojava front and center of, of the discourse in, in Europe, especially uh, in, in the US to a degree, but obviously we don't see those mass marches so much in the United States. Um, and even with you know the, the way that Germany treats uh, the PKK, for example, and allied organizations, like, like the, this has centered the existence of Kurdish people, right? The very fact that Kurdish people are a people and have as many rights as any other people, I think is one that like the diaspora has done well in, in centering in discussion, where it's, um, in this country, we have a relatively smaller diaspora, uh, which is growing, thankfully, uh, at, at, at the moment, but like, I think all of you involved in advocacy as you are will, will have noticed that it's very hard to, uh, to, to get your foot in the door with respect to even talking. Uh, about the existence of Rojava, right? Uh, like I have no doubt that if I had been uh, in the, in another conflict zone and 39 internal security forces being killed in a single strike by a US-made weapon, uh, when these people are supposedly the allies of the United States, there would have been a story. Uh, but because of where I was, it, it doesn't seem to have been one of any of that, sadly. So I think they do play an important role. Um... Thank you. That was, it's a, it's a sad thing to have to think about people being stuck at the border as increasing the Kurdish diaspora here. Yeah. You know, it really is tragic. At, at the same time, it, 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 I think like for those of us who have spent time um, in Rojava and, you know, with Kurdish communities, there's, it's a really rich, rich, culture that we can all learn so much from at a time when people are in their lives really so alienated in so many ways. And, uh, and uh, I, I personally uh, hope, not, not through people having to be stuck at the border, but I hope that the diaspora grows here in the United States, because I know that it has actually made a big difference in Europe in terms of people's ability to organize and to really have a, a loud voice. Um, um, I, one of the questions, James, that came in on the chat, and then after that, I will I will get to you here, Urban, um, is that a question from somebody who was very interested in uh, whether you met any trans people, um, whether at in Rojava and Myanmar and Yakumba uh, on the border, um, and if so. How are they getting along and sort of what are their circumstances respectively? Yeah, and um, so I meet uh, trans people in the Gumba relatively regularly, right? Uh, it's just certainly, unfortunately, discourse on trans people has become more and more toxic despite you know, trans people have been here for as long as there have been people, but very recently this has become something that people have decided to demonize. Uh, and it's worth obviously uh, Any time we're talking about these things, right? Like the the U.S. border is on Kumi Island. It's Kumi Island to the south, and it's Kumi Kumi Island to the north. And they were there before the border, and they'll probably be there after the border. And uh, it's two spirit, gender non-binary, transgender people, right? A spectrum of genders has existed since before this was America. And these folks are coming here to be safe. Um, and I've never seen them treated with any bigotry or disrespect in in the camps uh we obviously treat them with equal dignity and respect as we would anyone else uh it, i would love to know how they were treated by the department of homeland security uh, and, and i've reached out to them to ask but obviously they're very afraid of criticizing an institution which holds the keys to their future in its hands right so i understand that they don't want to talk about that I didn't meet any trans people in Rojava or Myanmar. Um, I did ask Congress staff, um, and we had a very good, I think, an interesting and, and sort of fruitful conversation where they said anyone's welcome in the women's movement, and it's not the goal of the women's movement to define or exclude people. Uh, we talked about how perhaps it was contrary to the goals of a women's movement to define who belongs in a women's movement by who's able to give birth to children, because it, it's about a much more broader feminism than, than that. Um, and, and they said that, that trans women would be welcome in the women's movement. Um, so I, I thought that was, uh, you know, positive and they've always been very good about that. Uh, but yeah, we, we meet trans people at the border very often. Uh, there are asylum seeker refuges. Um, 
Jardín de las Mariposas and uh, Casa Arcoiris, this butterfly, butterfly garden and rainbow house in Tijuana are two shelters for them. Uh, if, if that's a cause that you're concerned with, you can donate to. Uh, but yes, we we see them all the time, and of course we we try our best to treat them with the same dignity and respect we treat anyone else. Thank you, Hiro. Thanks for being so patient. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> um, let's see. I have kind of a number of meandering thoughts that I'm going to try to cohere <laughs> into something. My whole life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. <laughs> um, there's kind of a number of like uh, light bulbs that have gone off a, a couple of different times. Um, so like there's there's definitely a lot of like really good conversation happening around border solidarity and kind of like coming in to support people. Um, I think like Another thing that people can be thinking of is like there's there's a number of different places where there are Kurdish diaspora present in the U.S. There's also a huge Kurdish diaspora in Toronto, um, and Canada has a way better track record for taking in refugees. Like I don't want to give too much praise to a state or whatever, but I, it's definitely been a lot easier for people to go up there. Um, in Toronto, where I'm moving, there's also like a a pretty good like or organized presence on the ground of kind of like the Kurdish diaspora has like a, a Kurdish community center and there's kind of like a you know there's there's a system there for people to be taking you know taking refugees in and giving them housing giving them shelter giving them food and stuff um I think that there's like places where this model can be can be replicated um maybe across the U.S. and another thing that we're seeing up there is that um uh, like there's kind of like a need for skill shares, um, kind of, especially with like technical skills, kind of like computer oriented skills, um, because, uh, you know, the kind of job market or whatever in the tech sector, um, is always unstable, but it's also easy to grift them into giving you money for at least a short period of time that you can then save. <laughs> um, and so if people are, uh, if people are interested in kind of like forming a skill share, like, that's something I can help with. I think that's something a few of us can help with. That's not really a question. I'm sorry. I'm just... <laughs> well, I, I was interested in your point about Toronto because um, some of the reason that they're here is because of the pathways that are available to them. They've told me that the appointment to get the Turkish side of, of a visa done uh, will take several years for them to get that appointment, right? So um, to, to get approval from the Turkish government to leave, essentially. What they can do in Mexico is they can, it's a tour, it's a visa waiver tourist trip. So they're, and they're there for under 30 days, they can come on a visa waiver. Uh, so that's what they do. And they generally don't fly to Tijuana, they fly to Cancun uh, and then make that trip north. Um, so I think the reason they're coming to the US is not because they think necessarily it's going to be the best place to be as a refugee, but because that pathway is open. Um, so that, that may be a little harder with Canada unless it's also a tourism visa waiver. Thank you, and thank you for that. And I think that a lot of people actually have been very curious about that because this is, as I said before, kind of new news to us. We are getting kind of close to the to the end of the time that we had designated for this. I do want to uh, just there was one one more person who asked a question that I think I will um, offer here, and then maybe we can wrap up. Um, they, they wanted to know whether there is solidarity efforts going on in terms of other peoples that are affected by Turkish aggression. And uh, James, I'm not sure if that's something that you would know, but um, it, it's a good question since Turkey is, is yeah. spreading itself far and wide in terms of its, its various uh, imperialist endeavors. Yeah, uh, I haven't seen those, but I, 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 you know, I think there are always solidarity efforts and often we don't see them. I, I can talk briefly about solidarity I have seen, which is very inspiring. Um, to say that we're a ragtag group of people at the border is to understate it, but it is Quakers, anarchists, uh, people who themselves have come to the United States. Uh, and uh, we have a group of Sikhs from the Bay Area, Sikhs coming next week. Uh, they're, uh, as a faith, they have always stood alongside people in times of turmoil and been through difficult times themselves. Uh, and many of them are coming too because of Modi's uh, persecution of their faith in India. So uh, I messaged a friend, he messaged his friends, so they booked a flight and they'll be here in a week. Uh, so 
we have seen really impressive so i've also seen afghan people afghan people who left afghanistan when the united states abandoned them a year ago a year and a bit ago who two years ago now well um who uh who come to the u.s and are now here helping right uh uh there are groups like haitian bridge alliance who are helping another outdoor detention site in uh in san diego proper san Isidro, right at the border um so we have seen a lot of solidarity the two big groups and i saw some people asking about this in the chat who are doing stuff at Acumba are Al Otro Lado, that's A-L-O-T-R-O-L-A-D-O, -O -O, and Border Kindness. Uh, they're both migrant advocacy groups. Both of them do amazing work. Uh, they're both very dear friends of mine. Uh, and they're groups that you can support. Uh, we're looking at other ways to, to, to fundraise. But there's really impressive solidarity. Like it, it's, it's really nice to see people from all over the world really coming out to help right um there are people that we, we've had people come to hukumba from church groups in arizona even i met a guy from yuma which is a long way from hukumba if you look on the map you have to look at hukumba hot springs on the map uh you, know, you might get a different place in mexico um but because he'd, he'd seen what was happening he'd appealed to his church to help his church said he didn't want to so he'd left his church and come to hukumba uh, which I thought was a very forthright action on his part. But yeah, we've seen solidarity from so many people in such a touching way. Um, just absolutely screw, you know, absolutely nothing from the state. No, no support whatsoever. Uh, like I was just telling Debbie before we started, we're trying to buy MREs off the US Department of Agriculture, which they probably have sitting in a warehouse and they will go bad before they use them, but we can't get them. Um, and so, yeah, the, the solidarity has been exclusively between communities and not from the state, and the aid has not come from the state. They just spend that money on drones. I think that that's really a great place for us to end in the sense that you've really also underlined just how important solidarity, community to community solidarity is. And that's in a certain sense what ECR is all about. I mean, I think we have really been the organization in the United States that's been consistently there, uh, you know, for the Kurdish cause and that um, everything that we do is in, is, is, really geared at trying to educate and to really bring people together. And that includes, you know, some really fun things like direct contacts with people at the university that, that people in our group develop when they do things like say, teach an English class or volunteer to do that, or um, do the kind of outreach that we're doing with other, with artists and with other uh, organizations and you know, for example, the, the prison abolition movement. So we really um, urge people to get involved. We'd love to have you, um, as I mentioned at the beginning at our website, which is easy to, to, to remember, it's just defendroseva.org. You can find all the information you need. You can also find a link to our uh, donation page, which we, I think, fortunately have finally gotten up on GoFundMe. Um, thanks to the hard work of uh, our other steering committee members. And so um, we really need you. So please get involved. One of the things that I also wanted to just mention, because I, I don't think I did earlier, is that our reading group um, is really great and has been uh, very um, positively attended and you know had, had a lot of people there. So I know that a lot of people here are interested in education and in learning more. And one of the ways you can do that is to keep an eye out for our next uh, reading group. Uh, if you uh, send your email, we'll, we'll let you know when that is. And that's been a, a very sort of supportive and also very kind of in keeping with the Kurdish effort, which really is based around education. And, you know, as a lot of people know, these kinds of popular revolutions don't just happen out of nowhere. They take years and years and, and they take a lot of education. And so we're trying to do that too. Um, in the meantime, I guess I'll just say, um, take a last look at our chat for the live GoFundMe link, which uh, Arthur has been busily getting up while during this event which is great. Um, thank you everybody for being here today. Special thanks to James, um, really, really appreciate it. And of course people can hear more of James at the supremely popular It Could Happen Here podcast, which he is part of. And thank you everybody 
for your support and your solidarity. Um, have a great, happy and healthy holiday season. Stay in touch. And uh, Biji Rojava. Thank you for having me. That was really fun. And please do get in touch if you'd like to do anything to help on the border. Uh, I'm, I'm easy to find on the internet. Thank Thanks you. again.